So we welcome everyone to our um, Bhakti Shastri study of Bhagavad Gita and we're, we're studying unit two. You know, one and one and two is it? Anyway, the first six chapters we're studying. So we'll go to the screen. Everyone can see the PowerPoint, okay? Yes. Yes. Good. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Nice to be asa san there. Okay, revision. Yesterday we talked about how a jnani, the jnani meaning the person with knowledge, how he acts without incurring, in, incurring reactions. So there were many different verses there from the fourth chapter and the fifth chapter describing the jnani, how he's working, but there's no reaction. So nice, nice calm, calm yoga. He has knowledge, he's working without attachment to the results and then so he does not get any reactions. The consequences of impersonalism resulting from the misapplication of the jnana explained in the fourth and fifth chapter. Misapplication of the knowledge, the jnana. And so we misapply the knowledge. We think that we're supposed to stop all activity. We think that Brahman realization is the ultimate realization. And we think the goal of life is to merge, to become one. And we think ultimately everything is one without variety. So this kind of thing comes about due to misunderstanding the knowledge explained in the Bhagavad Gita. And when we take up that impersonalism, then people don't know how to properly engage themselves in spiritual activities and they often get involved in politics or they take up welfare work and doing philanthropic activities like that. And then compared Falgu and Yukta Vairagya, 
based on the Bhagavad Gita, fifth chapter. So this was speaking about working without attachment to the results and Falgu Vairagya is to renounce work, to stop all work. We want to, that's false renunciation. Everything is Maya, don't do anything. Don't see anything, don't speak anything, don't hear anything, don't do anything. That is Falgu Vairagya. But Yukta Vairagya is to utilize the senses and the mind and the intelligence in the service of Krishna. Are there any questions on these different topics which we studied yesterday? Anybody has any difficulty understanding this? You have to read it again several times, gradually, you can understand. Then we spoke about who is responsible for the suffering of the living entities. This is a, an important topic which is discussed, you can see it's there in the fourth chapter, it's in the fifth chapter and it comes again in the thirteenth chapter. You could say it's a question of who is the doer, who actually did the activities, who is responsible. Somebody may say, I never did it. Oh, if you didn't do it, then you're free of responsibility. So who is the actual doer? Krishna said he's not responsible. We may say, well, Krishna is the supreme controller. Krishna is all his fault. But Krishna said he's not responsible for the sufferings, for the uh, doings of individuals. He doesn't take the responsibility. When we act in the improper way, he's not responsible. Then someone may say the modes of nature are responsible. But the modes of nature, the material nature, is under the control of Krishna. Right? In the Bhagavad Gita it says, this material nature is under my direction. Maya Jakshina Prakriti Suyate Sacharacharam Etunanena Kunteya Jagat Viparivartate. So the modes of nature are not independent. The modes of nature don't act on their own. They act under the desire of the living entity. The living entity desires to be situated in a particular mode. And then he gets some particular reactions. So the point is the living entity is actually responsible for the suffering. We are all responsible and based on the desire of every living entity. So we should desire to cooperate with Lord Krishna and to surrender to him. And that way then we can be freed of the suffering. But when we act independently of the Lord, then we bring suffering on ourselves. It's our own fault. It's nobody else's fault. Okay, so we're going on to this last lesson. This is called the perfection of Gyan. Right? This is... So here's the objective of the lesson today. It's not a long lesson, very short lesson today. Explain the relevance of Gyan in the practice of Bhakti with reference to verses and analogies in Bhagavad Gita 1427 and 1854-55. So the, you can see this first lesson, first uh, stuff section of the Bhagavad Gita is, is topical. We're not just sticking only to the first six chapters. The, the, this course is based on topics. So some 
quotes are there from the 14th chapter, the 18th chapter. Yesterday we had the 13th chapter. We, you may say, I thought we were just studying the first six chapters. But in order to cover fully the topics, we bring in these other verses from later parts of the Bhagavad Gita. In future classes, you'll be going over the other sections of the Bhagavad Gita. All right, so here's the famous verse from the 18th chapter. Brahma Buddha Prasannatma Nasochati Nakankshati Samasarveshu Bhuteshu Madbhaktim Labhate Param. Brahmabhut, right? Brahmabhut means one who is situated in Brahman. In other words, he knows that he is a soul, that he is not the body. One who is Brahman realized he is in Brahmabhut, Brahmabhutta consciousness. And, and because he is in Brahmabhutta, because he's realized he is not the body, he is prasan atma. Prasan atma means a joyful soul. He's joyful because he's realized he's not the body. He's detached from the body. He's no so he has no material desires. He's taking pleasure in the self, in the soul. So he experiences that, that pleasure just knowing I'm not the body. What a relief. And when you know you're not the body, then you don't have to worry about old age and disease and death. You don't have to worry about so many other things which are there in relation to the body. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. To previous discussion and then the current one. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, uh, my question is, um, we as a living entity come to this material uh, we had uh, or we have some desires left over and then obviously uh, we can see that uh, without desire uh, not fulfilled completely it is really difficult to practice devotion service and sometimes this is happens uh, um, how is that and we can also see easily in our movement many senior devotees also left either or maybe doing something else so at this one point actually desire has to be fulfilled another point actually we think like you know we are not the body at the same time we are not that i mean not we in the same, not really sometimes mature enough to uh, overcome uh, false tendency like i don't have any desires so what could be done maharaj is it like krishna minimize uh, our like when we do Mm. some akarmic reactions like to in order to fulfill the desires he will minimize uh, our suffering how is that uh, function Maharaj? <laughs> minimize our suffering well we have to understand the nature of the mind is to desire we're not going to stop desire, but the jnanis and some yogis, they may practice like that. They want to make the mind still, to stop desire. But in devotional service, we want to purify desire. So desires will always be there. We just have to be conscious of what we desire. And we want to desire in relation to Krishna and Krishna consciousness. And that will save us. But if we do dwell on material desires, then they'll be endless. You will, we will never be able to satisfy all of our material desires. They will come one after another, after another. It, there's just no end to it, There's so many desires. It's, it's a very dangerous situation. 
Therefore, we have to practice controlling the mind and restraining the senses, not being the servant of the senses, but being the master of the mind and the senses. So, desires, as I said, that's the mind. The mind will desire. But we have to watch, we have to be careful what we desire. And for who? For what purpose? We have to understand how this, this mind will... The mind is not always a friend, of course. The mind can be our greatest enemy. So we have to be very careful to keep the mind under control, purify our desires. Yeah, it's good to, it's good to desire, but we just want to desire for the service of Krishna, rather than for our own self, desire for Krishna. That will be safe, then we're safe, we have a good situation there. But if we desire simply for the body, we'll never be satisfied, we'll never get peace of mind. Because there's always desires coming, one after another. They're not going to end, they're not going to stop. So it's important, it's important for us to understand the nature of the mind and to regulate this, to get control over these desires. So, Coming to Brahma Buddha, is, is that clear, Prabhu? You understand? Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. And uh, about the um, consequences, Maharaj, even uh, with the desire, fulfilling the desired consequences, because devotees also suffer either because of the uh, unfulfilling desires, or how is that, Maharaj? Well, devotees may suffer because they didn't control the mind, because they listen to the mind and they try to fulfill their material desires. And of course, like I said, you, you don't, you don't, it doesn't stop there. It's not that, okay, now I'm satisfied, there was another desire, there's another, and then there's another. It, it doesn't stop. So the consequences of not controlling the mind are very very, very dangerous. And as you say, devotees, you see devotees that sometimes they give up Krishna consciousness, they go away from Krishna consciousness. Why? Because they didn't regulate the mind, they didn't purify the mind, they didn't practice the process of Krishna consciousness seriously by regularly hearing and chanting. Now, if you don't do the hearing, if you don't do the process, then it will be very difficult to control the mind. It will be very hard uh, to get people to follow four regulative principles is difficult for most people. Prabhupada said it's not difficult for him, but because he was born, like he was brought up like that. But not everyone's so fortunate that they're brought up in that kind of situation. So if we're not, you know, we have, we have maybe bad habits from before, and then if we don't continue the process of Krishna consciousness, regularly chanting and endeavoring to control the mind, then we'll give in to the mind, and the mind will take us into maya into all kind of bad activities again. So that's what happens. People come to Krishna consciousness and they do some service for some time and they're happy for some time, but somehow they slacken, they deviate, they go off, they don't keep up the chanting, they don't keep up the practice, and then the material desires come in and the material desires start to take over one thing after another, after another. So that's what happens. Maya is very subtle. 
she comes in, you know, and you, you don't notice. You think, oh, well, just a little bit. Oh, I'm just going, just, a, just one time. You know, just let me try, you know. And Maya is very, very cunning. She checks us, she brings us into her kingdom. And we're thinking, well, a little enjoyment. We're thinking enjoyment. We're not, we don't realize what, what is actually taking place. It is actually more entanglement, more suffering in the material world. But we're thinking a little enjoyment. So we have to be very careful, very conscious. Prabhupada would sometimes say devotional service is like being on the, the razor's edge, on the edge of a razor. You have to walk very carefully. A little slip and you get cut. So devotional service is like that. If we follow carefully, we're safe. But if we go off, if we start to deviate, then the material desires come in and they uproot our devotion. Mm -hmm. So that's why association is very important. Take good association. Keep yourself in the association with devotees or at least hearing and chanting and reading books, Srila Prabhupada's books, very important. So if we're strict, then it's very easy. If you follow the process, it's very easy and very natural. And Krishna consciousness awakens. But if we deviate, then it becomes difficult. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for that. Okay. All right, so this verse, Brahma Bhutta Prasanatma, one who knows his Brahman, is a joyful soul, nasochati, nakanchati, does not hanker or lament for anything. Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu, he's equal to all living entities, sees everyone the same. Madbhaktim Labhate Param. So in that stage, he comes to take up devotional service. Right? 1854. One who is thus transcendentally situated at once realizes the Supreme Brahman and becomes fully joyful. He never laments or desires to have anything. He is equally disposed toward every living entity. In that state, he attains pure devotional service unto me. So Krishna consciousness begins from this platform, Brahma Bhutta, knowing that I'm not the body, right? This is the beginning of Krishna consciousness. But this Brahma Bhutta, this is the goal of the Jnani and the Mayavada, Mayavadi. Their goal is to come to the Brahma Bhutta. For a devotee, this is where we begin. But the jnanis, this is their goal. They want to come to this Brahman platform because they say everything is Brahman. And for them, their ultimate goal is to enter into the Brahman. Brahma Bhutta. Right? from Prabhupada's purport, right? Someone like to read? Prabhu, you could read for us. The one who asked, the devotee who asked me that question, you could read yeah. that, please? Sure, Maharaj. Brahma Bhuta. This means that one who is engaged in pure devotion service to the Supreme Lord is already in a state of liberation. One is with the Absolute. Without being one with the Supreme, the Absolute, one cannot render service unto Him. In the Absolute conception, there is no more difference between the serve and the servitor. Yet, that distinction is there in a higher spiritual sense. Purport 1854. So there is no distinction between the, serv the served and the servitor. 
Who is the served? Who is that? Kirtida? Who is, who is served? Krishna. Yeah, yes, good. Krishna is, Krishna is the served. And who is the servitor? The souls. Hmm? The, um, the, the servitors. Yeah, the devotee. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. yeah, you can see in the picture there's the devotee and he's offering his worship to Krishna. So one who is engaged in devotional service is already in a state of liberation, Brahma Bhuta, to come to the platform of Brahman, knowing I'm a soul, I'm not the body, that is liberation, that is the platform of liberation. But that is not our goal, that is where we begin devotional service. But for the jnanis, they think, they think this is the goal. Then Srila Prabhupada explains, without being one with the Supreme, the Absolute, one cannot render service unto Him. Are we one with the Absolute? Kirtida, are you one with the Absolute? I think not. We have the same qualities, but we are not equal. One in one in one in what? One in quality, right? Yes, we have the same qualities, but we are not equal to the Lord. Right, we have the same qualities, but we're not equal. One in quality, different in quantity but one in quality. So the Lord Krishna, is he Brahman? No, he's the person, the personality of God. But is he Brahman? He's a, uh, Brahman is a person and a personality, person. Lord Krishna is, Lord Krishna, we'll ask other devotees, is Lord Krishna Brahman? He's Parabrahma. Yes, he's a Parabrahman, right? He's a Parabrahman. He's the Supreme Brahman. And are we Brahman? Kirtida, you said you're Brahman, right? Mm, yes, we are the spirit. Right, yeah, you're Brahman. We are all Brahman. We are tiny sparks of the Brahman, but Lord Krishna is the Supreme Brahman, right? So we're one with Krishna in quality, but different in quantity. So when we understand we're not the body, we come to that Brahma Buddha stage, at that point we become one with Krishna, one with the Supreme. And Prabhupada said, without being one with the Supreme, we cannot render service unto Him. We want to be, we want to give service to Krishna, we have to come to that Brahman platform. We have to understand, I'm not the body, and then we can come to be, serve Krishna properly. So therefore, in the absolute conception, and the absolute conception, the, fine, the, the, the full conception, no difference between the Lord and His devotees. Yet the distinction is there in a higher spiritual sense. This, the, this, the distinction is there that we are the part, a tiny part of the Supreme and Krishna, He is the Supreme. All right? so. A little difficult to understand sometimes, Prabhupada's purport, but is it clear to everyone what Prabhupada is saying here? This is, this is knowledge, you see, understanding that we are one with Krishna, we are Brahman. Therefore, we are offering, we are making a are often, and we have to we have to realize we're not the body. We have to realize we're Brahman before we can give service to Krishna. We have to have that consciousness. 
Well, yeah, you could talk, you could, every, ultimately everything is a chincha beda beda, one and different, yes. Certainly we're one with Krishna and different. So, yeah, you can say that too. It's all, certainly it's here on the higher spiritual sense, achintya beda beda tadva, inconceivably, simultaneously, one and different. We are one with Krishna and at the same time different from Him. Different from Him in the sense that we are very tiny, infinitesimal, and Krishna is very great. And one with Him in the sense that we are Brahman, that we are also of that quality, that nature. All right, so now, relevance of jnana in bhakti. Jnanavam mam prapadyate vasudaiva sarvamiti. Oh, okay. Bahunam jnanmanam ante jnanavam mam prapadyante vasudaiva sarvamiti samahatma sudurlava. Right? 7, 8, 7, 19. So we've just taken part of the sloka. Anyway, that sloka says, after many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me. Such a soul is very rare. Here we have put, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me, knowing me to be the cause of all causes and all that is. So the goal of knowledge, what is the goal of knowledge? Saki Harini, what's the goal of knowledge? To know that the Lord is the highest. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. Yeah, the goal is to surrender to Vasudev Krishna. The goal is to surrender to Krishna or Vasudeva. That is the goal of knowledge. People often ask, what is the goal of knowledge? Because Gyan is very popular. People are very attracted to Gyan. You know, you can see even in the material world, people who spend so much money for education. And you go to college, we spend so many years get to get knowledge, training, learning different science and technology and so, so many different aspects of knowledge. Ultimately that knowledge is useless, but it's a training for the mind. It's a training for the mind, it's a training to sharpen our intelligence. And the ultimate goal of all that knowledge is when we surrender to Vasudev Krishna. So, is Gyan relevant in Bhakti? What do you say? Is Gyan relevant for us in the path of Bhakti? Whatever the ultimate knowledge is. Hey, go ahead, Prabhu. Can you? Yeah, Maharaj, whatever knowledge we acquire that should uh, leads to ultimately un to understand Krishna. Yes, certainly. Knowledge helps us to understand Krishna. Anybody else? Maharaj, we have to know who to surrender to. That knowledge is essential if you want to surrender to. Okay. Yeah, we have to know who to surrender to. Now we showed the yoga ladder previously and jnana was one of the lower stages of the yoga ladder. So do we need that jnana in order to come to bhakti?
Yes? Somebody? Aparagandhar Vika Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, yes, Maharaj, we, we need the Jnan to come to Bhakti uh, to some extent. Um, especially uh, in the 15th chapter, uh, Krishna has said, Vedas uh, Chachahar, that the essence of all uh, the Vedas is to understand me. So if we are able to understand, uh, if we are able to get the knowledge, then we will be able to uh, uh, perform bhakti and surrender to the Lord, surrender to the Lord and then start to serve him in bhakti. So if someone's illiterate, does it mean he can't become a devotee? Uh, yes, Maharaj, he can become a devotee. Uh, uh, getting uh, illiterate, uh, I mean, uh, getting transcendental knowledge, uh, it is heart to heart from a devotee. Yes, getting knowledge, you can hear from yes, a devotee. Yes, Maharaj. So getting knowledge, uh, uh, we can learn um, by f from a spiritual master and uh, we can uh, get the knowledge uh, about the Lord and there it is not material knowledge where it uh, involves our material intelligence or how we are literate or anything like that. So uh, even though we are illiterate, we can get, get the... Uh, knowledge and we can get spiritually cultivated through our spiritual master and then we can perform bhakti okay yes good okay so knowledge is the, the knowledge we want in bhakti is not material but it's in relation to bhakti Prabhupada explains here first one becomes Jnanavan. Jnanavan means one who has knowledge. Then he surrenders to Vasudev. This is one process, right? That's one process that you get knowledge because we showed the yoga ladder, remember? Karma yoga, then Jnana yoga, and then Dhyana yoga, and then Bhakti. So like that. So. You get the knowledge and then you surrender to Vasudev. That, that's it, step by step process. However, another process is you become a devotee of Vasudev. Then Gyan will automatically come. If you become devotee of Vasudev, Bhajo Vasudevam, then very quickly you will become Jnanavan. Bhaja Vasudeva means worship Vasudeva. If you become a devotee of Vasudeva and worship Vasudeva, do the bhajan of Vasudeva, Krishna, then very quickly you will become Jnanavan. You will get the knowledge. The knowledge will come. Krishna will give the knowledge in the heart. It will awaken. Because Krishna is in the heart. So the knowledge is also there. The knowledge is not going to come from some other place. The knowledge is there, will awaken. When we do the bhajan, when we become devotee, so two processes, right? One is step by step and the other is simply become a devotee. Just like we say, take the lift. Instead of walking up the stairs, you take a lift and get to the top. So we simply begin bhakti yoga. And then the other, the other limbs of the yoga ladder, they will all come where there is devotion. Where there is real devotion, there will be also detachment from the fruit of work. And there will be an awakening of transcendental knowledge 
and there will be remembrance of Lord Krishna. Everything comes in the heart of the devotee. The scriptures give an example, just like when we eat. When we eat, we will feel relief from hunger, we will feel nourishment and satisfaction and strength. It all comes about as we go on eating. As you go on eating, you become satisfied. You reach the point you're satisfied. Enough. Now I'm fully satisfied. So all of the things come. In the same way, when we do bhakti yoga, then we get also detachment from the material affairs and we awaken transcendental knowledge and we develop devotion for the Supreme Lord. Right? Is this clear to everyone? Yes. So, uh, can we say the, the, the gyan or knowledge that is required or, or necessary for bhakti is self realized knowledge? Is that the point we're getting to here? Yes, that's it. If, that's it. If you take the first process, first one becomes gyanavan, right? First. We, we develop that self, that knowledge of ourself, understanding something about ourself, about the mind and the senses and the nature, of, like the mind and the senses and conquering over the mind and senses. So that's becoming Jnanavan. And then he surrenders to Vasudev. That's after. First you have to become Jnanavan. So, as you say, to become Jnanavan, you have to become self-realized. Now, yeah, they have to, one has to understand his own self, his spiritual being. So we said, we, be, we began the class Brahma Buddha Prasanna. You have to come to that level of Brahma Buddha. So, for the Jnani, that's the goal. They're happy. They get to Brahma Buddha state, they stop. But, in Krishna Consciousness, that is only the beginning. Right? So, so Self-realization, they may realize the Self, but their, their realization has not, com it's not complete. Because they have not realized their, they have not realized their relationship with the Supreme Lord and they have not taken up devotional service. Just like one may be a yogi, they may do a stanga yoga and they may meditate on the, on the Lord and they may think they are actually the Lord. Some yogis, they, they, they think they are the super soul. They think, oh, I'm the super soul. And then, so they stop. That, oh, I'm the super, I, I'm the, I am the super soul. That is me. They don't understand that they are the servant. They're meant to be the servant of the super soul. So, cultivating knowledge is part of the process. One has to go on to surrender to Krishna. Self-realization is not just understanding I'm not the body, but then we have to understand, I am a servant of Krishna. Then that is actual self-realization. Okay? So, exercise for you. What is the role of Gyan in the practice of Bhakti? Yagna Prabhu? Yes, could we have, could you put devotees with a partner? How many people are here today? Okay. So one group of three and others with two.
हरे कृष्ण महाराज जी Yes, definitely. There's some importance there in having gyan. If we don't know anything, you know, just like sometimes people are chanting Hare Krishna, but they don't know who's Krishna, <laughs> and they don't know why they're chanting. Oh, everybody did it. They just told me to do it. I did. They don't know anything. So. Can we also say that uh, unless we have the knowledge, we will be stuck at the Brahma Bhuta stage? So we we should know uh, when we say we should know both sides of the coin, and then only then we know the full picture. So unless we know that you know we are not supposed to stop at the Brahma Bhuta stage, we will not be able to go ahead. So in that sense, we should also. Yeah, no, we should attain knowledge. Mm. Yeah. Well, of course, we have to have some knowledge to come to the Brahma Bhuta stage. I would think, <laughs> right? The, but that that would be that's only one one stage of the knowledge. Yeah. As you say, we we have to go on. But you know, we're talking about. Bhakti. So somebody is just doing bhakti. So they may not have come to the Brahma Buddha stage. They're just doing bhakti. But uh, isn't but but when one is doing bhakti, isn't he already in the Brahma Buddha stage? Hare Krishna, Mataji. My internet just went up twice there. And of course, that will to to be a part of the discussion here just now. Is now is only the internet came on back. Sorry, Prabhu. So you could hear me. My internet went out twice. Okay, uh, Prabhu, we were talking about how uh, Brahma Bhuta is only uh, one stage in knowledge, and it is not the ultimate stage. And I was asking. It's the beginning stage for a devotee. Yes, yes. So I was asking Maharaj, a devotee is already in the Brahma Bhuta stage, right, Maharaj? Like you were saying. Yeah, well, well, the beginning. Wait. That would be an assumption. I don't know how valid that assumption is. Some devotees may be in the Brahma Buddha stage, but you know, I don't know if we could say that everybody's on the Brahma Buddha stage. A pure devotee is in, in a Brahma Buddha stage. Mm -hmm. A pure devotee is in a Brahma Buddha stage. Oh, a, yeah, a pure devotee. Yeah, he's beyond that. He's beyond the Brahma Buddha stage if he's a pure devotee. Yeah, he's beyond that. And there are different levels of, you know, being Brahma Bhutta. Somebody may understand, you know, I've heard I'm not the body. It doesn't mean I've realized it. We can still be in the bodily concept of life, although we know we're not the body. So how much are we in the Brahma Bhutta stage? So then can we say that we need jnana to understand on what stage we are in even in bhakti yes that's a good point yes very nice that it will help us to understand where we are what level of how we've progressed in our bhakti
Yeah. Okay. Very good. I'll leave you to it. This meeting is being recorded. sensors, they put some uh, small software into the uh, computers which need to be monitored. And that small software actually sends back the data to the central server where it makes sense of that monitoring data. So similarly, the Paramatma sits in the each and every body, in the heart of everybody, who actually kind of uh, uh, the local uh, monitoring and management of the, the field is the body, is our uh, unconscious activities like digestion, the breathing during the sleep. So all these functions, involuntary functions are managed by the Paramatma. So I think that, that is where uh, uh, the man is actually the is, if we understand this, then then we will actually make progress because then we will understand we we don't control this body fully. Only some voluntary actions which are permitted by the Paramat we can control it. Otherwise, uh, we are dependent on. Sorry? Are you a server administrator, Prabhu? No, no, no. I am uh, into sales. So we okay, okay. Christian sales. Uh, okay. Because you are talking a lot about servers and all, then I thought maybe you are a server administrator. <laughs> no, yeah, actually I wondered since long is how the monitoring happens. So I inquired a little bit and they told me that they put one agent onto the, each of the servers, the computers which need to be monitored. So it, uh, and of uh, reminded me that Paramatma is also sitting in everyone's heart. So once once the person is there, he goes to the Yamaraj house and there uh, there are two persons, Shravana and Shravani. I mean, the names may be different, but uh, one one is a Shravan who actually uh, takes the accounting of every karma he has done. So he takes the accounting, the download from the Paramatma. That's what mentioning the root Quran. And Shravani works for the yes. image and the counterpart. The same analogy is there, the IT monitoring. So Bharat Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu. Have you got all the notes? Uh, I noted probably. Like one more thing we can add, like uh, as Krishna gave knowledge to Arjuna on the battlefield. So Arjuna first became devotee, then he got the knowledge. So like uh, if, if knowledge has not been important, so Krishna hasn't given the knowledge to Arjuna. From, from this example, we can see knowledge is important before we practice the spiritual path. It is, we need to understand the philosophy. So I want to add this more point. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, add it.
This meeting is being recorded. Okay, Yagna Prabha. Yagna? Yes, Maharaj. Can we call, end the, you can close the groups and then come back. Okay, is, it, is everyone back here, Jan? Not, not here. Yeah, now everyone's back now. Okay, thank you. All right, what is the role, the role of Jnana in the practice of bhakti? Let's hear from Bharat Prabhu from group number one. I thought he had some... Good points. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj I will be presenting. So like uh, we are telling the role of Jnana in practice of bhakti. So like if we are performing any devotional service without knowledge, so that is not so much fruitful. If we perform the devotional service with knowledge, it becomes more fruitful. Like if we are serving Lord daily, on a daily basis, but we do not know that he is a supreme personality and he needs to be served. So we will not get so much result. But if we know that he is our supreme master, then we will serve him. And we will serve with more devotion to him there. So here the role of knowledge comes to the Jnana. Going, performing with knowledge and the activity. Well, 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 just a minute. I could say, you know, didn't Krishna enjoy more when we serve him without knowing he is the supreme? That Krishna comes himself also to hide the fact that he is supreme. So you said uh, we'll enjoy more when we know he's the supreme. Yes, uh, uh, without knowledge, like uh, it's like a sentiment that we deal with the Lord. Without sentiment, we consider him son, father, or our relation. So we become too, sen too much sentimental. But we can't elevate to the path of bhakti because uh, after some time we can back out means our, our sentiments can change. They will not be remain fixed stability. We only we become stable in bhakti. Okay. We get the stability. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, there has to be some knowledge in <clears throat> the beginning. Yes. Yes, because I, if we even perform the material thing, so that also requires knowledge. We perform. So here is the spiritual thing. So it all uh, there is so much necessity of having knowledge for performing a spiritual activity. Uh, like uh, also like our of shastras also our acharyas have read Gita, Bhagavatam, they, they have written so much scriptures. So there is a need for us, for the future generation they have given us the shastras. So we have some knowledge from them and then perform our correct devotional services. Oh, very good, yes. Otherwise they haven't uh, written anything. Uh, Krishna hasn't told Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu hasn't told the the Chaitanya Chaitanya the Kaviraj Goswami hasn't written anything. So from the future perspective, like coming generation, we get uh, more uh, into depth of the spiritual activity. So there's a need of knowledge. Yes, very so, good. So has also written so many books. Mm -hmm. Why? Because so that we can get the knowledge and progress in work. Otherwise, Prabhu Paji doesn't have written books. He said, oh, keep reading my books, you will get everything. <laughs> There's no need to go anywhere. Yes, very good. Everything nice. is in that. Okay, very good. Thank you. And but... like, uh, this is a permanent knowledge, spiritual jnana. This is a permanent, whereas material, we, the next birth, we again have to take admission nursery and start again. But spiritual, there we stop, there we start in the next life. Okay, very fine. Thank you, Prabhu. Very nice. Thank you, Maharaj. Very much. Uh, all right, uh, R R Radhika Manaji, you had some nice points to offer also. Could you share them with everyone? Krishna Maharaj, yes. 
I mean, most of them, it was because you were there to guide Maharaj. Uh, so we were discussing about how uh, the Brahmabhuta stage, a devotee, a pure devotee is in the Brahmabhuta stage, but not all devotees. And there are different stages of Brahmabhuta. And unless one has the knowledge of all these stages, one cannot practice pr perfectly. So it be this. So we concluded that in order to know or in which stage of bhakti we are, we need jnana. Uh -huh. Yes, there's different stages of bhakti, right? We see when we study nectar of devotion. There's devotional service according to rules and regulations. So we have to know the rules and regulations and then become spontaneous and then it can become ecstasy and then it can become pure love of God. And so we have to know what is the, the process and what are the different stages what, what we have, which we have to go through in the practice of bhakti. Without experiencing ecstasy and <laughs> prema, that, then we can understand we're not perfect in our bhakti. And so we have to improve our bhakti, that we have to increase our remembrance of Krishna. So knowledge certainly helps us in that practice. All right. Is someone else like to share anything which we've not covered so far? Maharaj, may I? Please, yes, please, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, uh, we came with a discussion, Archana Mataji and I, that uh, in 7.2, it is mentioned that real knowledge can be achieved only by the devotee of the Lord. So after becoming a bhakta, uh, that knowledge also can be increased. Uh, with Krishna's mercy, we can get that knowledge of understanding Krishna. When we get that mercy of Krishna, then we gradually understand what is, uh, we become self-realized. That who am I, what is my relationship with Krishna and how I have to serve him. So, instead of uh, that, still Prabhupada has mentioned further that knowledge of the Creator is important. But the source of knowledge is also important. That's from where you are getting that knowledge. So that discipline in succession is important. When we are in bhakti, the jnana which we are uh, achieving, we should know from where we are getting it. And in 7.17, it is mentioned that jnana helps a devotee to become uh, engaged in the devotional service. And it also helps us to get rid of the materialistic desires which will ultimately lead us uh, to become a pure devotee. And in 7.18 also, uh, it is mentioned that uh, the devotee who want, sorry, uh, if one, ha one has the complete knowledge of Krishna, so that particular devotee who has complete knowledge of Krishna becomes dear to Lord. It is not that others are not dear, every devotee is dear to Lord, but one who is in complete knowledge is very much dear to the Lord that has been mentioned in the translation and purpose. And uh, that person, that devotee achieves the ultimate goal of the life. And uh, Jnana in Bhakti also helps us to become situated in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So that was our submission. Maharaj. Okay. Thank you, yes, thank you. Yeah, we see in Bhagavad Gita uh, there there is confidential knowledge, and then there's more confidential knowledge, and then we have the most confidential knowledge. So there are degrees of knowledge. There's realization of Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. So just knowing we're not the body, that is confidential knowledge. But the more confidential knowledge, we understand about the, the super soul, and the Lord's energies. And then the most confidential knowledge is understanding Lord Krishna's relationship with his devotee. How, how Lord Krishna takes care of his devotee. How he carries what we lack and provides what we 
maintains what we have and how you will protect the devotee. So, uh, there are different degrees of knowledge in the Bhagavad Gita. All right, any other points? Okay, we'll go ahead. With just one more. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I have one question. Yes. Uh, that uh, as Lord Krishna uh, teaches Arjuna in Kurukshetra, uh, that uh, first he taught him Jnana Yoga, other limbs of yoga, then he comes to Bhakti Yoga. So, if as you said that uh, if, if we do Bhakti Yoga, then all the limbs of other yogas automatically comes. No need to we no, no need to perform them separately. So then. Why don't, why didn't uh, Lord Krishna teaches uh, Arjuna directly Bhakti Yoga? Why he comes to first Gyan Yoga, Bhutti Yoga, all that, and then comes to Bhakti Yoga? Well, Lord Krishna has to remember Arjuna, the whole, the whole Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna didn't want to fight, and he had his different reasons why he didn't want to fight. So Lord Krishna was defeating these arguments of Arjuna. By defeating the arguments of Arjuna, at the same time he was able to explain Atmatattva, or the science of the soul. And he could explain to us very clearly the basic knowledge that the soul, the difference between the soul and the body. So that was very important in the practice of bhakti. Because before we can actually do bhakti, we should actually understand that we're not the body, that we're souls. Now somebody may be, they may be going through the different activities of devotion. They may be doing work in the temple and cleaning and making garlands and so on. But they, they don't, and they say, yeah, I'm doing bhakti. They don't know anything. They don't, they don't know they're not the body. Nobody ever told them. And so they will get some benefit because they're doing some service for Krishna, but that is actually a Gyata Sukriti. It's not actually bhakti, but what they're doing is a Gyata Sukriti, that unknowingly they're performing the pious activities. And by performing these activities, it will qualify them for bhakti. And when uh, the qualification for bhakti is that they're ready to hear they will hear, for, and they come, they come to the temple, they do some service, they're helping, and then they, somebody gives a class. So they actually hear, and then they learn, they're not the body. And that's important part, it's actually very important that we understand we're not the body, otherwise how will we ever understand Krishna? If we don't know that we're not the body, then we'll think Krishna, he's all, that, that Krishna, he's just like us as well. There's no difference between Krishna and us. Because Krishna has a body and I also have a body, so there's no difference. So Lord Krishna had to explain the Bhagavad Gita and he put the bhakti in the middle, the middle part of the Bhagavad Gita. It's like a, like a sandwich. And the Acharyas say the bhakti is protected by the karma and the jnan on either side. It's just like a sandwich, you have the good thing in the middle. You know, you have maybe you have the cheese and the, the tomato and everything is all and the, it's all there in the middle. You know, the nice tasty part. And on the outside, you have the bread. And so. Bhagavad Gita, the bread is like the karma and the yoga, but in the middle you have the bhakti. And the, the karma and the yoga, the karma and the jnana, they can bring us to bhakti. Because bhakti, we can, bhakti is not just being idle, but by karma, by working for Krishna, we come to bhakti. And by knowledge also, we can come to Krishna. So both karma and jnana, they're meant to lead us to the bhakti. 
so sometimes people think they think that gyan must be higher than bhakti because gyan comes at the end of the bhagavad gita so they think you know because it's at the end that's the highest but no it's not like that it, rather it's like the sandwich and we do find bhakti there in the 18th chapter the lord krishna says surrender to me give up everything and surrender so that is the conclusion of the bhagavad gita taking shelter of krishna and we'll see also the the most confidential knowledge which is stated in the ninth chapter it's repeated again in the 18th chapter manmana bhava mad bhakto madhyaji mam namaskaru right engage your mind in thinking of me become my devotee worship me and offer obeisances unto me so this statement was made in the ninth chapter and then it's made again in the 18th chapter just to enforce it on us that this is the real purpose of the bhagavad gita to become the devotee you don't find any other verse repeated again you don't find anything about gyan or karma repeated but that verse about bhakti that is repeated so that's a clear indication to us of the importance and of the supreme position of bhakti over everything else thank you okay so going ahead another discussion for you how is your understanding of the yoga ladder and gyan in the bhagavad gita increased after studying this unit maybe you can just contribute without going into your groups anybody have, have you got some understanding now of the yoga ladder and gyan after studying this unit saki harini madaji please give us a comment um louis maraj i think before studying this unit um even when i was reading bhagavad gita i was not really clear about what karma yoga gyana yoga does and is it relevant like you know in helping us go to um chapter 3 and chapter 5 were very confusing and both of the title of karma yoga so i was not really um you know able to understand but definitely after this unit i think it has helped me understand the basic differences between the um karma kanda and karma yoga um but how you know krishna is explaining to arjuna that karma yoga is better than karma sanyas and then now uh, last two three classes about the gyana how it is important in you know um as a as a ladder it is important in elevating us to krishna consciousness and just now we talked about the um you know knowing just that we are body and you know we have a difference in the body and soul and their super soul is not enough we have to that is a platform to elevate us to you know serve krishna so that is just the beginning so um that understanding the ladder has you know definitely improved a lot but at the same time that bhakti is independent of all these so if you start doing you know bhakti and devotional practices krishna from within your heart will enlighten and and get um, the gyana by itself. Thank you. Very kind, very nice. Yes. Uh I had the experience one time I was you know I I often I, I often preach in China. So one of our Chinese devotees was going to distribute books and he was distributing Bhagavad Gita in one of the universities there in China. and this one of the, the he was talking to a student and he was showing him the bhagavad gita and he was explaining to him about the bhagavad gita and the student said to him he said he said you you know this book better than i know any of my books <laughs> you know he was a, a student at the university and he was studying but the devotee who had the bhagavad gita he was preaching the bhagavad gita to him and the, the this young student was really amazed he said you know this book better than i know any of my books 
So that's how it should be. Prabhupada wanted that. Prabhupada actually told us, he said, we should always take Bhagavad Gita with us. Wherever we go, carry a copy of the Bhagavad Gita with you. And in Prabhupada's time, often it would be like that. Devotees, we would go out on Sankirtan and we would carry our Bhagavad Gita. We, devotees would have a little bag made to put their Bhagavad Gita in. And then they'd carry a book bag with all the books which they're distributing. But they had their own copy of the Bhagavad Gita. And then if they met somebody then they would, they, they, who was really interested, they would get a chance to really preach to them. So that was, anyway, that was Srila Prabhupada's mood, that he wanted us to really know these books. He wrote to one devotee, the temple president, uh, I, was in, I was in New York at the time, and the, devote, the temple president, they were having an, an initiation ceremony, and Prabhupada wrote the letter to the temple president saying, you should cram my purpose. So cram, you know, you, you, did you ever cram for, a, for an exam? Examinations, you know, you have to cram. You didn't do much work, you didn't study, you're really a bit behind. So you really have to cram for a few days before the exam. So Prabhupada wanted, I said, you should cram my purports. He wanted us really to, <laughs> to know these books and get to know these books. So, I feel myself, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not so happy with how uh, we arrange these classes because it's a bit choppy here and there, not just dealing with the first six chapters. We did take references from other chapters. And I don't know how the lecturers will do it in the other units. They may go verse by verse. So if they're going to go verse by verse, it would be better, I think, that the first six chapters that we also go verse by verse. But I told Krishna Prabhu, he liked it, we, he thought it's better if we do topics. So, you know, they, we worked with this PowerPoint which was more on topics and we picked up things from other chapters. Anyway, I hope you all benefited from this course. Any other comments, anything you'd like to con say? Bharat Prabhu? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, it was very nice to experience having thoughts with you, sharing thoughts with you and getting knowledge about Bhagavad Gita uh, all around from you and good time. So I would like to request that like, if you can share your memorable pastimes with Prabhupada and your senior disciples because like we can have some knowledge about them, we can learn something. Oh. Well, my, I, I, I wasn't so, I'm not a big devotee that I had so much association with Srila Prabhupada. You know, Srila Prabhupada had a few intimate disciples but generally, you know, the mood was, don't disturb Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> don't, don't disturb him, keep away, you know. I was a very young devotee and I didn't have any big position. And so I didn't get any real personal association with Prabhupada. I just tried to hear Srila Prabhupada. That's the main thing try to hear, go to his classes and listen and find out what Prabhupada would speak about on the morning walks. You know, only a few people would be allowed to go on morning walks, but the devotees who would go, they would share. And different devotees who were serving Prabhupada, they would share their experiences. Devotees like Satsvarupa Maharaj and uh, uh, Brahmananda Maharaj and Tamal Krishna Maharaj, you know, they were all big leaders and they would share, they would tell us about Prabhupada, what Prabhupada is doing. So we'd hear from Prabhupada through the parampara, <laughs> through the
through the Parampara, through his senior disciples. Thanks, Maharaj. Please allow Thank you very much, Yuri Maharaj, for this session. Uh huh. Maharaj, I would like to say something. Yes, please do. Uh, Maharaj, are we going to uh, close this class after this? Yes. Is it like that? Okay, so I would like to present gratitude. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for everything you taught. It will help us to get rid of the Maya Scott. But now I think how much my conditioned soul will allow me to remember it all. But then the thought again pops up that, relax, Maharaj and Krishna's mercy will take care of that. Your cross-questioning sometimes made us hesitant to present the task. But it was for our progress only, then why should we stop? Thank you is not the perfect word to express our gratitude, but please accept it from your students who are subdued. Oh, you're very kind. Yes. Thank you very much for your kind words. You know, I encourage all of you, you know, after you learn th this Bhakti Shastri, then the best thing to do is to teach it to others. You, you make a group and you begin teaching yourself. You get some people together and, you know, share with them everything you've learned. That's the very best thing you can do. You know, just like I studied the Bhakti Shastri, I studied myself over in Vrindavan years ago. And the teachers that time were people like Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Danardara Dhar Maharaj, Barijan Prabhu. They would teach us. And then after learning from them, then I got the opportunity to also teach. So I teach regularly. And practically every year I was coming to Mayapur. This time I'm locked down in Mayapur. I've been here for more than a year. Uh, so every year I was coming regularly for like three months. I'd come before the Gorpunima and I would teach a part of the Bhakti Shastri and part of the Bhakti Vaibhav for a month or two and then observe the Gorpunima here. So this year, last year Krishna arranged, I got locked down here in Mayapur, so I'm still here in Mayapur. <laughs> I may never leave, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to be here. There's no better place, I think, to be locked down than in the Holy Dham. So very glad to, that I could have this opportunity to share with you the studies on Bhakti Shastri course and I hope you all continue and go on and teach whatever you learn, you teach it to others. That's a very good thing to do. So, yes Prabhu? Uh, I would like to personally and also on behalf of my family express gratitude to you uh, for engaging us so nicely. In the beginning classes I had a lot of difficulty with my internet. But as soon as that was resolved, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, the presentations you were making. Uh, I feel personally that the amount of notes I've made from this class is not going to benefit me right away, like for the examination or anything. But in the future for preaching or understanding the subject matter a little more thoroughly is going to go very far away. I really enjoy <laughs> the way you present uh, uh, your, your lessons. I feel very much inspired. Actually, it's a real pleasure uh, to get to meet you. Thank you very much for everything. Okay, thank you Prabhu, very kind of you. I'm also very happy to have the opportunity to associate with you and look forward to meeting you sometime. Okay, here's a verse from Prabhupada about the process of hearing. Anyet vevam agyananta shrutvanye upasate Tepi chatiti rantiva mrityam shruti parayana. Shruti parayana. Oh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, you don't have to worry. Your open book. This is not 
this, you see, that's ten years ago. <laughs> okay, the process of hearing. Again, there are those who, although not conversant in spiritual knowledge, begin to worship the Supreme Person upon hearing about Him from others. Because of their tendency to hear from authorities, they also transcend the paths of birth and death. Very nice verse in the 13th chapter, text number 26, right, for, for the importance of hearing. If you, if you just have that tendency to hear about Krishna, so good. In this verse, particularly, the process of hearing is strongly recommended, and this is very appropriate. Although the common man is often not as capable as so-called philosophers, faithful hearing from an authoritative person will help one transcend this material existence and go back to Godhead, back to home. Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So Hi, Krishna. Yes? I just want to do thank you because um, I wouldn't have taken this course, you know, without uh, your recommendation. I think you forwarded to my sister and then myself and Archana got the opportunity. We're so happy to get to learn from you and we're missing you so badly in Thailand. And we don't want to do a lockdown in my brain anymore <laughs> to get to your association soon. <laughs> Okay. So thank you so much. Um, I have never felt so enthusiastic in learning about Bhagavad Gita. And I think Bhakti Shastri is a really amazing course. And like you said, I think we should encourage everyone to take it and then go and preach. So I'll do my best, Marsh. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I'm sure you can. You're a teacher. You're an educator. So it's very good for very appropriate for you to teach this. All right, so today's Ekadasi here. I have a lot of chanting to do. I have other classes as well later on. So thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Thank you very Hare much. Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai. Hare Krishna.